Hello, welcome everyone to our second installment of the four part series exploring the landscape of artificial intelligence as it relates specifically to radiology. My name is Matt Stankert. I'm a fourth year medical student currently out on the virtual application trail and a member of the Society of Interventional Radiology's Medical Student Council. I'm joined today by my co-host and fellow medical student, Gabe Lee. Gabe, would you like to say hello to everyone? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you tonight. Uh, like Matt, I'm another fourth year med student on the virtual interview trail, and um, I think we got a good one tonight. So looking forward to hearing Dr. Yi speak. Yes, absolutely. And I will just say before we begin, uh, if you did miss our first episode, I do encourage you to go back and give it a listen, uh, especially should you find that you enjoy this discussion here today. You know, if, we, if you like what we have in store for you today, I guarantee you're going to enjoy the last episode. So go back, give it a listen. Uh, it can be found on YouTube. Just give a search for SIRRFS, that's Society of Interventional Radiology Resident and Fellows section. Uh, webinar, the date was 11 10 20, that's November 10th, 2020. And you can search for uses, limitations, and barriers to implementation of AI and radiology. So finally tonight, it's my distinct pleasure, and we are particularly honored tonight to host Dr. Paul Yee. Dr. Yee is a current fellow of musculoskeletal imaging at Johns Hopkins Hospital, as well as affiliate faculty at the Johns Hopkins Malone Center for Engineering and Healthcare. He's also a founding co-director of the Radiology and Artificial Intelligence Lab uh, at those institutions. He completed a fellowship in imaging informatics with the University of Maryland Medical Center, as well as a residency in radiology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Yi received his bachelor's in medical science, summa cum laude, and MD from Boston University through the seven-year accelerated medical program they have there. And prior to his career in radiology, he completed a research fellowship in total joint arthroplasty at Rush University Medical Center with Dr. Craig Delevalle and two years of orthopedic surgery residency training at UCSF. Dr. Yi's current research interests include the development and application of artificial intelligence and deep learning towards medical imaging applications, with particular interest in neuroradiology and musculoskeletal radiology. Dr. Yi is the recipient of numerous national research awards, both within the fields of radiology and orthopedic surgery, including cum laude awards from the Radiological Society of North America and the American Rankin Ray Society, as well as the Frank Stinchfield Award from the HIP Society. He's published over 50 articles in the peer-reviewed medical literature and has presented over 100 research presentations at the national and international level. And that is a very serious resume, and you can tell by that we are so honored to have Dr. Yi here tonight. Uh, Dr. Yi, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you, Matt and Gabe, for the uh, opportunity and honor to talk to all of you tonight. Um, first, I want to apologize for not being able to show my face. Um, we had some technical difficulties, so I'm actually calling in from my phone. Um, I couldn't get my webcam to work for some reason. Um, but yeah, with that, um, tonight I want to talk to you all about um, AI and radiology, why collaboration is key, and talk about some clinical use cases. The following are my disclosures. Um, I do have research support from the RSMA, as well as support for an event um, called the AI Medical Student Symposium from the ACR. And I work with a company called Bunker Hill Health, which is doing some really exciting work in multi-center validation of deep learning algorithms in radiology. So um, before we begin, I just wanted to share a little bit about my background, mainly to show you, one, the perspectives that I come from, as well as to show you that, you know, I'm not some, I'm not that far removed from any of you um, who might be in medical school, maybe even applying or starting residency soon, and to share with you a little bit about how I got started in AI and informatics. So first, um, I entered radiology after initially starting my training as an orthopedic surgeon. Um, but when I entered radiology residency in 2017, a couple of attending radiologists from my program at Hopkins and I, we had an idea to start doing some research with deep learning and radiology. And that led to us founding a group called RAIL, or the Radiology AI Lab. That same year, we partnered with engineers over at the Malone Center for Engineering um, in Healthcare, which is a center based at the School of Engineering designed to facilitate interdisciplinary research between physicians and engineers. Then in 2018, so you know, within the next year, I started presenting research at societies like SIN, um, which sparked a deeper interest in imaging informatics. That started turning into a deeper interest broadly in AI and informatics, and so I completed an imaging informatics fellowship at the University of Maryland under the tutelage of Dr. Ken Wang and Elliot Siegel, while also serving on the inaugural Radiology AI Training Editorial Board. And today in 2020, I continue to be involved with organizations like the RSNA, where I'm a member of the Machine Learning Steering Subcommittee, and working with companies in the AI space like Bunker Hill and the collaboration with Amazon. And then looking forward, um, I'll be joining the faculty at the University of Maryland starting in 2021, 
where I'll be co-director of a new center along with um, my colleague Jason Hofstetter, uh, Steve Rothenberg, and Elliot Siegel, where we'll be launching the University of Maryland Intelligent Imaging Center. And so I share that to illustrate three perspectives that have shaped how I view AI and its potential radiology. First and foremost, I'm a radiologist. My interest in AI and informatics came after I became interested in radiology and medicine. And so I approach AI keeping in mind the goal of improving patient care and human health. So a lot of what I'm interested in have come from a sort of outsider's perspective in the machine learning, mainly by trying to apply it to my primary area of expertise. Second, I'm an imaging informaticist. I'm interested in the science of information, specifically as it pertains to medical imaging. And this includes the application of technologies towards this goal, as well as practical considerations for enabling these technologies. <clears throat> and third, I'm a collaborator. I've been incredibly fortunate to work with really smart, talented individuals with skill sets that are really different from mine. And I think that's made all the difference in my journey thus far. And I hope to convince you all today that that can make the difference for AI to reach its potential to transform radiology. And so today, um, I'm going to start with a discussion about the potential for AI to transform radiology and why collaboration is key. Next, I'll discuss some clinical applications and use cases for AI and radiology. And then we can end it with a Q&A um, to have a little bit of a discussion. So first, the potential for AI to transform radiology. Before we begin, I want to ask everyone in the audience, how do you feel when you hear the word AI? So take a few seconds. So some of you might be like this, super excited, really looking forward to the future, thinking it's gonna transform things and make things better. Some people though, they might be on the opposite end of the spectrum. They might be pretty worried. You know, is AI gonna take my job? Is there gonna be a future in radiology? Others might be more in the middle, maybe a little bit more skeptical, you know, wondering, you know, is this AI stuff really, you know, gonna live up to the hype? And then others might just be curious. You know, you might want to know what's, what is this stuff? I don't really know how, what to think of it. And so I think all of these are reasonable responses. This is a word cloud of the top 25 non-scientific articles from a Google search for AI radiology. And on one end of the spectrum, we have words like future and promise, which are largely positive. But on the other, we have words that are not so positive, things like replace and pitfall. And so from this, I want to submit to you four themes to consider and guide our discussion. First is radiologists. The second is AI and machines. The third is optimism and ambition. And the fourth is skepticism and realism. And for full disclosure, this is my take on it. Um, this is a cartoon by a, a friend of mine and head of AI at DASA, which is a uh, medical research institute in Brazil, titled Fear of AI. The Y axis is my fear that AI will replace my job. The X axis is time. When I first started, my fear was pretty high, but the day I trained my first deep learning model, I dropped precipitously. All right, so let's talk about radiologists. So for anyone who's not familiar with what radiologists do, the majority of us spend our days in dark reading rooms like this, looking at medical images where we make interpretations and diagnoses. This can be things like making diagnoses on chest x-rays, things like an upper lobe consolidation indicative of pneumonia, or looking for multifocal ground glass opacities indicative of COVID-19 pneumonia. Some people look at functional advanced imaging like PET-CT to find metastatic cancers to the liver. We also do things like measuring tumors. And for probably most of you in the crowd, what you're most interested in is doing image-guided procedures using uh, minimally invasive techniques to put catheters in the blood vessels to do various types of treatments, as well as doing image-guided procedures like biopsies, even in places like the head and neck. So with that, as the imaging subject matter experts, radiologists are needed to generate labels for images for diseases or outcomes of interest in order to train machine learning algorithms. So this is an example of segmentation annotation for pneumothorax in a chest tube that's used to treat it from the recent SIM SDRAI pneumothorax challenge. And this is where over 18 radiologists spent over six months with a total of nearly 60,000 annotations just to have enough images for this challenge. So even for a relatively modest data set size, a tremendous amount of human effort was required to properly annotate these images for segmentation tasks. But in addition to data set annotation, one consideration is the need for quality assessment by radiologists. After all, the saying goes garbage in, garbage out. 
So many of you might be aware of the chest X-ray 14 data set released by the um, Ron Summers group at the NIH, which is comprised of 112,000 frontal chest X-rays. And just for a quick review, the frontal X-ray is on the left. It's basically where you shoot an X-ray just looking directly at a patient. A not frontal or lateral, it's from the side. And this seems like an easy enough task to catalog in metadata related to each image, maybe in the DICOM files or in the EMR. But when you look at the data set directly, there turns out to be several non-frontal chest X-rays that made their way into the data set, including several lateral images, as well as some abdominal radiographs. So even this relatively simple quality metric couldn't be completely accounted for through automated methods. So I think this is one area where radiologists are really key. So our second theme is AI machines. There's been much excitement about AI in general, and particularly when applied towards medicine and with good reason. We've seen it revolutionize things like facial recognition on Facebook and pave the way for autonomous vehicles, and now maybe towards automated diagnoses on medical imaging. And AI and machines hold a lot of promise, in particular deep learning. For anyone not familiar, traditional machine learning requires an engineer to specifically define features to be extracted for classification of an image. Deep learning gets rid of this step with the middleman, allowing for feature extraction and classification to occur without explicit programming. So a little bit more um, about how this works is through the predominant algorithm type that's allowed deep learning, which is the convolutional neural network. And at a high level, it works like this. You have one layer of the algorithm that's an input layer where you put in your image. This is then fed into a hidden layer, which are formed of various feature detectors. And these detect very rudimentary basic features, things like lines, edges, and shapes. These will then be combined into increasingly complex features. So in this case, the neural network is learning to identify eyes, noses, eyebrows, mouths. And these will become increasingly complex through many layers to become things that look a little more complex like faces. And ultimately there's an output layer that combines all of these to make a decision. Another key concept if you're new to deep learning is transfer learning. So this is basically where a convolutional neural network is trained on one data set as a starting place and they're fine-tuned on images that you're interested in. And what this does is it allows you to reduce the amount of data you need, which is important, particularly for radiology, where images are really difficult to come by. So in this case, um, it's an example of taking a neural network, pre-training it on ImageNet, which is basically over a million images of a thousand categories of everyday objects, things like cars, dogs, um, types of food. And then you can fine-tune it on things like chest x-rays, head CTs, ultrasounds, and any type of image really to get a trained neural network, particularly for that task. Inherent in the theme of AI machines are tech giants like Google, who have developed a lot of the technology you use for deep learning. And what I think is really exciting is that Google has started to step out into the medical imaging space for things like breast cancer and lung cancer detection. And as an academic, uh, one thing that I'm really excited about, they've published really in some of the highest level journals in journals like Nature and Nature Medicine. And similarly, a large number of startups have emerged in addition to the larger medical imaging companies. And all of this signals an interesting convergence of the tech and startup world with radiology. Our next theme is optimism and ambition. AI has created a lot of excitement over the potential for expert level analysis of medical images. We've seen papers showing expert level detection of acute intracranial hemorrhage on head CTs, identifying skin cancer on dermatology photos, as well as screening for diabetic retinopathy on images of the eye and the retina. And additionally for physicians, some believe that AI has the potential to free physicians from monotonous robot-like tasks and focus on what they were trained to do. In other words, making healthcare human again. One example of this is in tuberculosis screening, which is really a monotonous task of saying yes, no, possible tuberculosis for hundreds of images in a short amount of time. For example, at the University of Maryland, residents for a number of years were charged with screening chest x-rays for the Immigration and Naturalization Service. And over an eight-year period, there was an average of nearly 100,000 studies interpreted by residents per year, which amounted to roughly 2,700 per resident. So if you can imagine, this is something that is, can be pretty robot-like and could be um, really primed for automated screening. So um, you know, one of our early works in deep learning was 
trying to figure out methods for training deep learning algorithms for tuberculosis screening. And essentially, we did a semi-supervised approach using publicly available x-rays from the NIH, where we labeled 11,000 images originally by a thoracic radiologist, and we trained a neural network, which we used to then further label the rest of the images. And we externally tested these on radiographs in the USA and China. We were able to find um, the tuberculosis uh, pretty well as evidenced by these heat maps. And what I think is interesting is that when we evaluated real world performance in our own backyard on images from Johns Hopkins, we found that the algorithm, which we call TPNet, had pretty good specificity and sensitivity. And ultimately, this was pretty similar to two radiologists that we compared it against. But when combining the results in a majority vote, there was a synergistic effect with increased sensitivity and specificity than any one observer alone. And what I think is also interesting is uh, we evaluated whether or not this could identify COVID. And we found that um, this generalized pretty well. So just something for the uh, medical students who may not be as well versed with chest radiographs, you know, a lot of these diseases can look pretty similar. Um, so you can't necessarily always tell if it's COVID, is it tuberculosis, is it something else. All right, so we've talked about optimism. The last theme is skepticism and realism. So in life, as well as in AI, there's often a disconnect between what's promised to us and reality. And sometimes this is the case in radiology and AI. So this is an example of an algorithm that was developed at MGH out of um, Sin Hodo's lab, where they trained a, an algorithm to detect head bleeds. And so this is an example of finding a pretty subtle subarachnoid hemorrhage, which, believe it or not, is actually right here outlining the sulci. And they found an AUC of 0.99, which is essentially a perfect test, a perfect uh, diagnostic tool. But when they took another set of images from the same hospital, but from a different CT scanner, that AUC dropped to 0.83, which is still pretty respectable, but a far cry from that AUC of 0.99. And so we can see that oftentimes these algorithms that might perform well in a very specific test environment don't always generalize well. Another consideration is confounding factors. Um, the easiest way to think of this is that deep learning algorithms have been shown to make the right prediction for the wrong reasons. For example, shown in this work and many others, convolutional neural networks trained to identify pneumothoraces often focus on chest tubes rather than the pneumothorax itself. And this makes sense in a way because chest tubes are a treatment for pneumothorax, but that's not what we want the neural network to actually learn. And then one uh, additional illustrative example um, is for bone age. So bone age was the first task that the RSNA held a challenge for back in 2017. And the winners were a group of radiologists from Canada with a company called 16-Bit. And they had an algorithm that had a mean absolute difference of about four months compared to experts, which is a clinically um, reasonable uh, approximation. And so the way that bone age typically is done is you look at this book that's from like 50 plus years ago, you look at the x-ray and you basically flip back and forth trying to match it to the age that it most easily matches. But the question is, can we finally throw this thing out? And so when we look at the 16-bit um, app that they developed, there's a really slick user interface. You basically take a photo, you can upload an image of the, uh, the bone x-ray, and you get a nice predicted bone age. But what happens if you put a chest x-ray, you also get a bone age of one year, one month. If you put in a photo of flowers, you get 15 years, 11 months. And if you put in a photo of a radiologist like myself, you'll get a predicted bone age of one year, five months. I think I'm a little bit older in that photo there. And so all that to say is that AI, and specifically these deep learning systems, they don't have common sense, at least not in the way that you and I as humans think about it. And so this has implications for actually deploying these algorithms. If they can't tell the difference between a bone x-ray and a photo of me, then how can we possibly, at least currently, just let them go unattended? And so like with anything, it's important to know the reality and use it accordingly. There's one final note about um, skepticism. I want to point to a study that we did of medical students in the US. So we surveyed a group of medical students um, across the country at radiology interest groups for their attitudes for AI. We found that, perhaps not surprisingly, these medical students believe that AI will play a significant role in medicine, particularly in radiology, but nearly half were less enthusiastic about the field due to AI potentially for reducing the prospects for job security in the future. 
And so this leads me to the topic of collaboration. And so I think in our discussion over the past few minutes, we've shown and seen that there are strengths in both radiologists and in AI and machines. There's also truths in both views of optimism and skepticism towards AI and radiology. But I think ultimately to live up to the hype and overcome the skepticism around AI, collaboration is key in order to take advantage of the complementary and different skill sets and expertise between radiologists and engineers. And I really think that AI will change radiology, but it won't replace them. And one of the things I think that will need to change is collaboration and working with people we, we may not be used to interfacing with. One consideration is interfacing with data scientists. So Kaggle competitions hosted by radiology groups like the RSNA have shown that you don't need to be a radiologist to develop high-performing AI models for clinical problems. For example, these Kaggle competitions, like the most recent intracranial hemorrhage detection challenge, are regularly won by non-physicians who are data scientists, often in seemingly random parts of the world. This person from Shanghai, sometimes it could be a random teen from Belarus who won one of the sim challenges. And so the reality is that radiologists and other physicians we're not necessarily positioned to be experts in data science, but I think that we provide another perspective that is complementary. And so I want to submit to you that neural networks and AI models aren't the only piece of this puzzle. In addition to people who can train neural networks, we can see in this big circle on the left, we need people who understand machine learning and systems engineering to figure out how to actually deploy these things as well as people who understand radiology, imaging, and informatics to understand how to implement these in a clinically meaningful and a clinically responsible way. And I think just as importantly, we need people who put patients first. So pretty much physicians as well as radiologists. And so I think that who we need is we need a confluence of those different groups and these complementary skill sets and viewpoints. So next, I'd like to talk about some clinical applications of AI and radiology now that we've talked a little bit about um, the environment and the uh, setting and the uh, place that we find ourselves in today. So this is a simplified schematic of the diagnostic radiology workflow with examples of where AI systems can be implemented. And I think that there's also analogs of these for IR. So we can see here that there's everything from looking at the patient record, to actually acquiring images, to looking at the images and reasoning, to communication. And there's a lot of places here where there could be tasks that could be automated or improved using AI. So one of these would be even before we decide to take an image, we need to decide whether or not to order the scan. And so one example of these is for pulmonary embolism, which as most of you know, is when a blood clot makes its way from one of the veins, oftentimes the legs, into the lungs. And this can cause basically damage and death of the lung tissue. And to diagnose this, CTA is used, which is basically a CT scan through the chest where we put contrast in the blood vessels and it allows us to view the blood vessels as well as identify potential blood clots. And it's a really, you know, honestly, it's a pretty good scan, but the majority of these scans are negative. And the rub is that with over 99% often being negative, and with estimates of about a third of these being avoidable and not clinically indicated, this costs the healthcare system $100, $100 million annually in wasted um, expenditures. And so one use case, it's not necessarily on imaging, but on clinical data is when should we decide to image a patient? So this was a paper from the Stanford Amy group that sought to develop a clinical decision support tool to decide whether or not a patient should get a CTA. And what they did is they took a number of different clinical variables, things like demographics, ICD codes, medications, vital signs, and they combined these into various machine learning models to detect or predict the probability of having a positive PE. Furthermore, they compared these to two traditional scoring systems, so things like the Wells criteria, to see could this be a benefit to what we use, generally use today. And so basically they found that these various machine learning models outperformed the traditional uh, prediction methods. So once we've decided the image, we have to actually schedule them before we can even get the images. So this is a, an example of what an MRI schedule looks like. And you can see here, there's lots of time slots. They're varying lengths. Some of them are half an hour, some of them are an hour, some of them can be two hours. 
And if you can imagine having one patient miss or be late their appointment, this can throw everything off by a lot. And so one use case here is predicting scheduled hospital attendance with AI. And this is a paper that was published in Nature Digital Medicine, <clears throat> basically using these different types of machine learning algorithms to predict who might be a no-show, with the implication being that this can help you better schedule patients in a way that will avoid patients not showing up. And so just as an example of how big of a problem this is, in the United Kingdom, National Health Service alone, failure to attend scheduled hospital appointments costs the healthcare system over a billion pounds annually. So once we schedule the images, uh, next is actually acquiring the images. So I'm gonna try to play this uh, video, so I, hopefully the sound will work. Let me know if this is working for you guys. Hopefully right now you should be hearing a pretty loud MRI. I'm not sure sound is coming through. You may just want to describe uh, if that would actually right. convey what you're going through. Sure. So basically MRI machines have been shown to be um, really loud. And you know we often put earmuffs on patients or um, earplugs, but they've been shown to be at such a high level that it can be damaging to your ears, similar to a similar effect to being at a concert. And so the idea is that we really, it's not just a convenience thing for trying to make MRI scans faster, but it's also a potential hearing health um, consideration. And so in that spirit, Facebook AI Research and NYU uh, Radiology have teamed up for a project called Fast MRI, where they're trying to take sparse amounts of MRI data, meaning a quicker scan, and trying to still create and reconstruct diagnostic quality images. And they recently hosted a challenge for the public to develop um, high-performing algorithms. An example of this is taking four times less um, data, four times quicker scan, and still developing um, diagnostic quality images, which we can see here that these were all look pretty similar, but they were reconstructed from varying degrees of data. And just as a shout out, um, this is a student at Johns Hopkins Wedding School of Engineering who placed in the top three for the competition. But one thing I thought was interesting is that the other top three finishers was a company, uh, was a company Philips, as many of you probably know, um, from various electronics, as well as the University of Amsterdam. And I think that this shows that there's really a lot of different players in this area. You don't have to be part of a big conglomerate like Philips to develop a world-class algorithm. You could be a PhD student from a university. All right. So another um, use case after we get the images is actually processing images. And so one exciting use case is taking images and making them better than what they looked like originally. So one of these is from a company called Subtle Medical, which is a startup from Stanford, where they're trying to take sparse amounts of data and make them look better. So in this case, we can see a decent looking MRI on the left, but using this deep learning algorithm, the images are so-called uh, enhanced or they look a lot more sharp and they look a lot more, um, they just look better. And another way that they're looking at is trying to take, create diagnostic quality images, but reducing the amount of contrast that you need because contrast um, does have some potential side effects. Another example of taking sparse amounts of data is potentially using weak magnets that might allow you to do things like portable MRI. So this is a company called Hyperfine that recently uh, launched to have these portable MRI machines. They use a really weak magnet, less than one Tesla. If you look at the magnets that we use clinically, um, standard of care is really becoming closer to three Tesla. But what this allows is, is that it's safe enough to take into places like an ICU, into a clinic potentially, and actually take MRI machines. And if we look here, these images, they may not look quite as nice as the other ones, but you can use these diagnostically for things like stroke in a pinch. And so Hyperfine's machines actually had a pretty big use case this um, the past several months with the COVID-19 pandemic, where you don't necessarily want to bring a patient down to an MRI suite, contaminated and have to clean everything. Rather, you could take this machine up, scan them, look to see if they're having a stroke, and then wash out the machine as opposed to cleaning out a whole room. So next down the line, once we've acquired the images, once we've reconstructed them, the next is actually looking at the images and doing perception or trying to figure out what's the anatomy. 
what is the potential pathology here? And so one use case for this could be in something like leg length discrepancy in measurements. And so this is something that for me as a MSK radiologist, um, we get tasked to do quite often. And, you know, I think it's important for quantifying how much deformity someone might have due to variational diseases, but it's a pretty low level task. As you can see here on the image on the right, we basically draw lines from one part of the bone to another, draw another one from one part of the bone to the other, and we basically add them up. And so this seems like a perfect thing for AI to take over. And in fact, the group out of CHOP, um, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, developed a deep learning algorithm for this task, where they trained an algorithm to segment out the bones, and then from there, measure these things that radiologists typically do. What I think is really astounding is that this algorithm was able to do these tasks in approximately one second per patient, whereas the radiologist on average took 96 seconds. And so it could be a huge time save while allowing radiologists to really do things that are probably higher level cognitive tasks that they were trained to do. Uh, maybe something that's a little closer to your heart as um, interventionalists is identifying potentially intervenable or uh, procedural or surgical emergencies. So this is stroke, which is like a PE, where you have a blood clot that goes to the brain. And this is bad because, you know, if your brain dies, you could lose sensation, you could lose motor ability, you could even die. And similar to the chest, we use things like CTA where we're looking for blood clots. And so because time is brain, uh, one of the first use cases for deep learning in radiology was um, out of a company called VizAI, which was a company that is, that's developed the whole suite of stroke detection tools. And what's really interesting is not just that they can detect stroke on non-contrast CTs, on CTA of the head, look at CT perfusion analysis, but they developed a system, um, just going back to that Venn diagram, they developed a way to actually plug this in to the system that works for patients. And so what they've done is they've figured out a way to have a mobile phone app for a neurointerventionalist on call, where they're gonna get these results directly as the patient comes off the scanner. So this way there isn't this game of telephone where the patient gets a CT scan, the radiologist reads it, then the ED gets notified and the ED finally contacts the neurointerventionalist. This gets rid of all of that and goes straight to the neurointerventionalist. Another area of perception is quantification. So as I mentioned, radiologists, we often measure things. And if you can imagine, it's pretty time consuming. But I think that quantification has a lot of promise. So QBio is a startup that's based out in um, the Bay Area, and it's led by Gary Choi, who's a radiologist um, formerly at MGH. And their big vision is basically the physical of the future, basically taking all sorts of medical data, including whole body MRI, and quantifying these things and allowing there to be actual uh, biomarkers that we can take that are quantifiable. And so, like I said, they take whole body MRI, they look at cardiac function, body composition, liver fat fraction, et cetera. And they try to combine all these things to basically create the physical exam of the future. Um, in a lot of ways, people talk about CT scans being the physical exam in the ED. Well, QBio is trying to make that a reality. And then one final use case for perception and segmentation that might be closer to your hearts as future IRs is in uh, real-time surgical planning. So Caliber AI is a startup out in the Bay Area, and it's designed for real-time AI in the OR, specifically for orthopedic surgeons. So they'll do things like an arthroscopy, which is like an endoscope into the joint, and segmenting out normal anatomy, things like the tendons, things like the ligament, things like the cartilage. They also do automated measurements, and additionally do things like identify the phase of surgery, identifying the tools being used, the activities being performed. And so you could imagine a similar type of application for IR, whether it's identifying anatomy and segmenting out blood vessels, identifying instruments and trying to help guide them. So beyond perception is reasoning. Really, that's what radiologists do beyond just identifying these abnormalities. So one use case is in brain tumors. We can see here that there's a lot of different conditions in the brains, whether it's tumors, whether it's inflammatory, types of things like MS. And it can be pretty complex uh, to figure out what's what. And so one use case has been developing an AI system to not just identify abnormalities, 
but create differential diagnoses at a specialist level. And so this was a paper out of a group from UCSF and Penn, where they combined not only deep learning, but expert knowledge um, informed uh, Bayesian neural ne Bayesian networks, where they basically take a bunch of features and combine the best of uh, the world to create this differential diagnosis generator. And again, um, more towards the IR minded, uh, reasoning can also be things like figuring out what type of IBC filters in my patient. And so, you know, for things like doing surveillance of patients who might have an IBC filter that needs to be removed or in potentially doing recalls of IBC filters that need to be recalled, figuring out one, is there an IBC filter and two, what type of it could be really important. And so this is a paper from the Stanford group where they took 14 different types of IBC filters and they trained a deep neural network to identify the type of IBC filter. And what's really interesting is that this neural network was able to pick out and appear to focus on specific features that are unique to these filters. And they had 97% accuracy for the 14 different types. An additional area of reasoning could be in doing things like predicting the uh, outcomes or response to a particular treatment. So this is an example of uterine fibroid embolization, which is where a catheter is tunneled into the blood vessels feeding a uterine fibroid, which can be painful. And basically, putting in embolization material to block blood flow and have the tumor regress. And we often see this on MRI as a big tumor, which we can see in panel A. Post-treatment, it'll shrink down and hopefully reduce the pain that a patient is feeling. Um, sorry about that. Um, and so this paper, which is a collaboration between a group from Brown and um, UPenn and a hospital in China, was basically trying to predict on MR imaging who would respond well to uterine fibroid embolization. And so this was basically taking a T1 post-contrast sequence, a T2 sequence of the fibroid, and clinical variables and combining them using some traditional machine learning algorithms as well as deep learning algorithms to predict outcome. And what they found was they had 85% accuracy of the AI model compared to 72% accuracy amongst radiologists. Um, an additional use case after a radiologist has looked at the images is in doing reporting. And so if you can look here, this is um, what I look at every day, knee MRIs, the report on the right, and it's a lot of words. You know, it amounts to a lot of clicking, a lot of speaking, and a lot of synthesis with the impression, which is really like the uh, abstract or the summary of all of the findings I've described. And so if we could figure out a way maybe to automate this or help us out, it could really help deal with a lot of the mental load that we face each day. And so there's a startup out in the Bay Area called Rad AI, and this was founded by a radiologist named Jeff Chang, specifically towards the same. And what they do is as you dictate your radiology report, it will use natural language processing and try to figure out the summary in the impression so that once you're done describing all of your findings, once you're done looking through the images, you can hopefully have at least a, a pretty close approximation of what you want for that impression. And ultimately, um, one thing I'd like to leave you with is a potential vision for radiology becoming a diagnostic data hub. Uh, this was presented by VJ Rao, who's the chair at Jefferson and former president of the RSNA at the 2018 meeting, basically envisioning a future where, you know, as radiologists, we're not just looking at imaging, we're looking at lab results and we're integrating that with the imaging. We're looking at the history and physical exam. We're looking at genomics. We're doing quantifying or quanti quantitative analyses of images. So I think for me, that's certainly something that I'm looking forward to and hopefully seeing uh, happen in my career. So um, with that, I'd like to leave you with some take-home points before I move to a Q&A. Uh, the first is that AI has the potential to transform radiology and medicine. And ultimately, there are endless clinical use cases for AI and radiology, both in diagnostics as well as in therapeutics and intervention. And ultimately, I believe that collaboration is key, including from subject matter experts like radiologists like you. Um, I'd like to make a shout out to the Radiology AI podcast, which I co-host along with my friend and colleague, Danya Day, who's an IR at MGH, as well as um, 
just to ask you to look out in 2021 for the University of Maryland Intelligent Imaging Center. And thank you again to the SIR, to Gabe, to Matt, and the SIR staff for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Yee. That was a really awesome talk. Um, just want to say for all you listeners out there, feel free to use the chat um, if you want to, or the questions. If you want to ask questions, we'll uh, we'll just announce them as they come in. Um, you know, I think one thing that's really interesting about what you what you talked about, you know, you talked about so many different aspects of how we can apply and integrate AI into clinical radiology. Um, you know, cost savings, triage, image utilization, image processing, granularity. Um, predicting procedural outcomes. And I think one thing that really stuck with me is, you know, really what you're saying is that rather than be afraid of AI, radiologists should embrace it. It's, you know, it's allowing them to spend more time doing the things that they like to do and less time doing, you know, intensive, less enjoyable tasks. You know, you talked about quicker measurements or, or reading the bone age scans in, in, for people who don't want to do those anymore, that old outdated book. Um, and so, you know, this general workflow optimization and improving image throughput amongst radiologists, I think, is really really awesome and a big takeaway today. Um, I guess with all that said, you know, I, I had a question for you, Dr. Yee, you know, are, are there any particular applications that you're kind of most excited about amongst all those things that you talked about? Yeah, um, no, I think, you know, you kind of hit the uh, nail on the head. <laughs> I think there's, um, you know, for me, I think the thing I'm lo most looking forward to is taking a lot of these things that are really monotonous, kind of machine-like and automating them you know, for things like measurements, you would think that a computer would be really good at that. And yet we still do these manual things all the time. Um, when I think about tumor measurements, for instance, even, you know, we basically give a pretty crude approximation. You know, we're basically saying this tumor measures approximately up to, you know, this AP diameter, this ML diameter, and this cranial caudal. And we're kind of giving a, you know, rough estimate of tumors that are often irregularly shaped. If an algorithm could automatically segment out the tumor and then create a volumetric amount, one, I think that would be much better for patients because it's a more accurate measurement of, you know, what's the actual tumor size. And two, it would take a lot of the kind of toil and uh, monotony out of what I do in the day to day. So I think for me, that's what I'm most excited about in the short term. But I think long term, thinking kind of pie in the sky, what I'm most excited about um, potentially is using AI to identify knowledge and patterns and ultimately things that can impact human health that are beyond human perception. So there's been a lot of work looking into things like virtual biopsies, trying to take imaging and predict, you know, what's the genotype, what's the biopsy and the pathology going to show with, with the implication being maybe we can avoid doing biopsies in the future. And I think that's incredibly exciting when we look at things like glioblastomas. Um, there've been a number of work showing that deep learning algorithms can predict with pretty high accuracy in 90% of detecting if there's an IDH mutation or a 1P19Q um, mutation. And these have implications for treatment, but if you can imagine, it's, it's a pretty big deal to stick a needle in someone's brain and get a pathology sample. And so I think that when we think about things like that or things like what QBio is doing for developing the physical exam of the future, trying to quantify a lot of these things like, you know, what's the fat percentage in your body? Is that normal? How normal is it? Can it predict your risk of having some complication down the line? I think that these are all things that to me is incredibly exciting because, you know, for anyone who's looked at a CT scan, there's an incredible amount of data. And a lot of it, we kind of gloss over just in the name of, you know, our limitations as humans. You know, we're trying to figure out, does this patient have pancreatitis? Does this patient have appendicitis? But then there's all of that information about the muscle mass, the muscle bulk, what's the morphology, you know, what's the distribution of the fat, et cetera. And so for me, that's one of the things I think is really exciting. And then the final thing I think is identifying things like new biomarkers for disease that we don't know how to diagnose yet, at least not particularly well. So one example is a paper written by um, a friend of mine, Jeho San from UCSF, that won the uh, Arsene's Margulis Award uh, couple years ago. And they trained a neural network on, um, on PET-CT of the brain to detect Alzheimer's disease, which is a pretty hard task. Um, you know, unfortunately, Alzheimer's disease is a devastating disease. You can't necessarily treat it. But if you could detect it earlier, you could prepare families, prepare patients to get ready for that transition and maybe help them live 
and take advantage of the years that they have left. And so what they found in their study was one, not only could they predict uh, the onset of Alzheimer's disease, but they were able to do so on scans much earlier than radiologists would be able to detect it. And so that to me is just kind of scratching the surface of some of the possibilities. You know, can we start to predict or diagnose these diseases that we are, we're not able to at the present? So that's just a little bit of what I'm uh, excited about. Yeah, I think that's all really incredible just to think about and kind of think of this process of how, you know, we're moving forward in all these different fields. Uh, I, I'm sort of wondering, you know, I guess on an algorithmic basis, what is the most effective path forward in sort of solving these? You mentioned lots of algorithms won't generalize well and their ability to move from this topic to the next. A am I right in thinking that those issues are solutions that are solved by just more data? I mean, is it a sense where we can more effectively use data that we have, or is it some other influence in the field that may be uh, slowing progression forward? Yeah, um, you know, I think I think we're still trying to figure that out, you know. Certainly having more data can help. You know, if you look at various types of studies, both in the radiology and computer vision literature, you know, one, just having an absolute number of greater number of cases, you know, that's going to help your deep learning algorithms, um, you know, no question about that. But just as important, having an increased diversity of data, meaning from different patient populations, different hospitals, considering factors like what type of x-ray machine, what type of CT scanner, where these images are taken from, that also helps generalizability. But, you know, I think that the reality is, no matter how perfect your data set, it will never... 100% um, encompass what the clinical realities are, particularly because patient populations, they differ depending on where you're practicing. You know, the patient population in an inner city setting um, like New York City is going to look really different from, say, like Wyoming. It's going to look really different from, say, somewhere in Asia, like in Thailand. And so even those differences in disease um, distribution, that can make a difference in how the algorithms um, basically get trained. And so that's something called um, basically, um, it's basically a distribution drift, where the distributions can be different, and that's going to cause a drop in performance than what you might expect. And so, you know, I don't know what the best answer is. Um, I think definitely trying to increase the diversity of data. Um, there are some potential strategies that people are using, like basically taking a baseline model and then fine-tuning them on cases from your population. And that's been shown in some articles to be a potentially promising uh, solution. But I think ultimately, um, it's probably in a combination of all of these things. I think one interesting thing about the computer vision world is that the technologies really move at breakneck speed. You know, right now we're using convolution neural networks. We're talking about, you know, taking these uh, algorithms that have been trained on ImageNet, but who knows what that's gonna look like in five years. There might be a new type of algorithm that can overcome a lot of these limitations that we've experienced so far. So I think the short end of the uh, short end of it is, you know, I'm not sure. I think the data is definitely has something to do with it, but I suspect that some of the fundamental technologies and the um, maybe the technical approaches that we use that'll play a big part as well, and that's still to be written. Yeah, and you know, I think that um, your answer there kind of brings me to another question, leads me to, you know, potentially out of the scope of this talk of collaboration, but I'm interested in hearing your opinion about, you know, there's a number of barriers to, you know, getting to this utopian view of, of AI integrated into clinical radiology. And, you know, you talked about a number of them tonight, you know, uh, data acquisition, like robust data acquisition um, for training algorithms, you know, how do you get multi-center data with, with, you know, all the parties might not necessarily have a vested interest. Um, technological limitations, you know, recognizing a subarachnoid hemorrhage that's very subtle but not a good-looking Hopkins MSK fellow, you know, um, or, you know, economic aspects, you know, what does it cost to implement, or legal aspects, who gets sued when a mistake is made, and all these things, and I'm um, kind of wondering what you see as, again, kind of picking your brain, but what the, one of the, what barrier stands out to you, you know, in, integrating this stuff? Yeah, um, so if I'm hearing you correctly, you're asking what are some of the practical barriers and um, potential, I guess, obstacles in actually integrating AI or deploying them clinically, is that correct? Exactly, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I think there's a lot. Um, oof. So I think you could think of it in a lot of ways. I think one just kind of literally boots on the ground. You know, how do we actually implement these AI systems? You know, there's a number of different models that are being used. One is called on-prem or on-premises, actually having some type of um, computer server that lives in the hospital that can process images and run the algorithm that's been trained or developed by companies or developed by um, a team. And that has a benefit of being within the firewall of the hospital and reducing a lot of the concerns about uh, patient security. But if you can imagine, you know, that can be pretty costly. It requires someone there to maintain it. If something goes wrong, you got to have, you know, staff to kind of um, tend to it. And so the alternative option is moving things off premises, moving it to a server somewhere, sending up to the cloud, for instance, um, and having them processed elsewhere. And that is a benefit of being, you know, deployable all over the world. Anywhere there's an internet, um, you know, internet access, it allows a company to manage data, to manage the servers. But the problem is that a lot of hospitals aren't willing necessarily to send their data out, you know, out of their, uh, out of the walls in the hospital. And so I think that's one of the um, factors. But I think along with some of those kind of real practical ones, I think one of the other ones is financial. You know, the reality is that someone's got to pay for these things. Um, and if they don't, they have to take a, they have to take a hit somewhere. And so the ideal thing is to develop the way that these algorithms can be reimbursed for and that they can not only allow hospitals to break even, but maybe even make a profit since, you know, like I said, someone's got to pay for these things. They got to keep the lights on. And so um, with AI, it's really exciting. It's a had approval from the CMS for having reimbursements for using their deep learning systems. And specifically with the triage system that they've enacted through mobile phones. And so that's really, in a lot of ways, um, blazed the trail for future potential reimbursements. So I think that it runs a spectrum, you know? I mean, there's sort of the uh, practical things with the technical aspects, with the security issues, but then there's also the financial aspect that, you know, for better or for worse, it's a reality in making these things work. And so what my personal opinion is that the way forward is going to be working with um, entities like industry, working with startups, with companies, and trying to figure out how can we make the best use of, you know, their motivations towards, you know, being profitable, towards making money, as well as helping patients, with our common goal of helping patients as well, and perhaps some of our academic interests, perhaps our interest in trying to make our lives easier. And I think that's going to be um, a big part of the puzzle. It's trying to, you know, going back to this idea of collaboration, figuring out who all the parties are. And that could include, like I said, the companies, the physicians and the healthcare folks, the government agencies who are charged with regulating all of these technologies, um, you know, even patients themselves to figure out, you know, does a patient really want an AI algorithm looking at their images without a radiologist looking at them? I think all of that's going to be important to really making this a reality. And so I think that it's an exciting time. Um, I think that there's been a lot of progress and movement, and I think it's only going to continue to grow as the years and decades come. Doug, yeah, I think that was beautifully summarized. Um, you know, every time we have one of these and we get to have these conversations, I get more and more, exci more, and more excited about the future of our field, uh, the, our field, if I can even say that yet. Uh, Dr. Yi, I really appreciate your time tonight. Uh, I've just been blown away by the level of discussion that we've been able to have. Yeah, no, thank you. I've really enjoyed it too. And um, no, I really appreciate the opportunity. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, with that, I think we will wrap it up tonight. Again, I really appreciate you coming in, Dr. Yi, and you, Gabe, as well, uh, as well as to all of our attendees that are in the crowd tonight. Uh, I hope everyone has a good night and happy holidays. Yeah, happy holidays, everyone. All right, thank you. I will wrap up the webinar now. Everyone take care. Thanks, guys.